us for the second conversation. Uh, the second conversation of our Seeding Hope speaker series, the Segurite Seeding Hope speaker series. Uh, this second conversation, I'm going to tell you, fam, it's going to be a, a great one. It's going to be exciting, and it's also just also going to be beautiful. Uh, with that being said as well, really, I'm really humbled. I'm really humbled to be in this conversation with these two warriors that we have today, including the Mauna Kea, the young Mauna Kea leaders from the San Francisco Bay Area, and also our California Indian uh, activist and, and singer, uh, Desiree Harp, who's going to be offering the closing song. So uh, before we begin, we always acknowledge the great land that we're on, the important land that we're on right now, Huchin is occupied uh, indigenous land. For me as a daughter from Moana Nui, Moana Nui is an indigenous name that we people from the Pacific uh, give the Pacific. And it's uh, not only does it honor the land, but it also honors and recognizes a systems of relationalities of sacred relationalities uh, that draws our relationships, our va, as we Tongans call it, uh, meaning sacred relationalities throughout Moana Nui, the Pacific, but also embraces and it honors our relationships with our Pacific, with, excuse me, with our, our relatives here on Turtle Island and especially here in California. So as we begin today, as a daughter of Moana Nui, it is prodigal. It is prodigal, it's an ancestral uh, prodigal that we always acknowledge the land that we're on. You know, to our relatives that are here, the relatives that are joining us, the, the beautiful families, many of you have written to say that it's not just an individuals uh, joining in, but that you also represent families and communities. What we'd usually do in Wananui at this time is that we would uh, bring out a spread of food for everybody, you know, uh, roasted pig, uh, taro, uh, sweet potatoes, beautiful crops from the land. We would also have song dances to welcome you to our, our meeting today. And so perhaps in another time and place, we would do that, but also to honor our important guests that are here with us today, our brother Kali Benali and also our sister warrior, Lisa Tani Gray Garcia. This is what we would do in the Pacific, to honor first and foremost indigenous people on the land that we currently occupy, this land that's Huchen, and also for you, our important uh, speakers, and also for our young brothers and sisters that are gonna be doing the cultural song offerings. So perhaps then just following that cultural protocol, um, Karina Gold, we're very uh, humbled. We're very humbled also to have our traditional leader, Lishan Ohlone leader from this land, Hu Chen, who's going to offer us an opening, who's gonna say a few words and it's gonna offer us a few words, excuse me, offer us uh, an opening prayer. Thank you so much, uh, Fui, for introducing us that way and centering us in this space and place. I know that we're not all on Hu Chin right now. We have hundreds of people that have joined us right now, and I just want to acknowledge that um, I am also humbled to be on my own territory after the uh, immense, uh, genocide that happened to our people here, but to recognize that there are people that are currently under those same circumstances on their own territories now. I've seen one of our brothers from West Papua in the aud audience today, and I want to acknowledge them. I want to acknowledge the people that are from all over the different uh, territories right now. And I want to um, offer us to remember that today, um, although we may hear some crazy stories, some interesting stories, some that we are seeding hope right now in this time of COVID-19 when our populations, our indigenous populations are being devastated by this, uh, this, you know, this terrible uh, virus that's happening right now. Our, our folks that are living without a, a roof over their head, as we hear those stories, we wanna know that there is hope in all of this as well. And so I want us to open up our hearts to that and our minds to that. And so, with that, I wanna ask, um, ask all of our ancestors to come into this virtual space with us, to come into the rooms that we're sitting at right now, to center us so that we could open our hearts and our minds and our ears to, to uh, uh, a new way that we wanna be in this world, a way that we want to lay out for the next seven generations and beyond for us to begin to create and dream of a different way of being in this world and perhaps for us to begin to think about 
how do we go backwards? How do we think back into our original teachings so that we can go forward in this world to create, recreate a place that is clean, fresh air and water and soil for the next seven generations and beyond? And so uh, with that, I'll just offer a few words. Grandmothers and grandfathers, creator and ancestors, we thank you for our lives. We thank you for us being here today and for this gathering. And thank you for the organizers and the chanters. We ask for special blessings for all of our warriors on the front lines all over the world, our medical people that are fighting this disease right now. We ask for special blessings for the hearts of the families that are separated from each other, both um, because of this, this disease, but also those that are separated because of traumas, because of uh, the policies of governments. We ask uh, grandmothers and grandfathers for pity on our hearts right now. We ask that you to go to the hearts of those that are sick and let them know that they are not alone. Those that are behind the walls to let them know that they are not alone. We ask grandmothers and grandfathers for the protection of the culture bearers and the song keepers and our medicine people. We ask grandmothers and grandfathers to help us to be courageous at this time to stand up and to do the right things, to bring us back into the center, to bring us back together where human beings are supposed to be in the circle of creation so that we can remember our obligations and our duties to one another and to this earth that has given us everything that we need. We thank you, grandmothers and grandfathers, for sending the water to us from the skies. We ask that that continues to bless us and to nourish our foods and our medicines and our crops and our babies. We thank you so much for all of the things you give us. We ask grandmothers and grandfathers for, for happiness for those that are crossing over to the next world, that they are met with their, by their ancestors with laughter and song and good medicine and language. We ask for those that are left behind on this world to have good courage and good hearts and to remember their their loved ones in good ways and that their hearts are a little lighter. We ask for all those things that are in our hearts right now to be taken care of and that we watch over all of our family and friends and keep them safe while we go on this journey together. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for grounding us and especially me. I recognize that my notes on my laptop are not here. So we're just gonna, we're gonna do it really indigenous. <laughs> we're gonna do it from our hearts. So um, please bear with me, brothers and sisters. So this second conversation is, um, as you, thank you again for joining us for the second conversation, Radical Reciprocity, Mutual Aid Redistribution and Protecting the Sacred. I also wanna introduce uh, my co-host, uh, one, one of the co-hosts, because we're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, uh, some different folks also offering questions today. One of the co-hosts, a uh, wonderful young leader and uh, from, from uh, Diné, is, who's also of Diné ancestry and African-American, uh, Najoni Brown. Najoni, can you come up to and also introduce yourself? And she also is part of the Segorite Land Trust. Um, good evening. Um, nice to see everyone's faces. Um, so yeah, my name is Najoni. I'm from um, the West. So I'm from the village of Buchin. Um, in my family, we come from the Navajo Nation as well and from Mississippi and Missouri. Um, currently working with Segorite Land Trust and I had the honor of being a mentee of Karina and that's how I, I uh, came into this work, also a mentee of Inez. Um, and today I'm going to introduce our two singers from the Julio Mauna Kea. Uh, so that is Kioni Rod Rodriguez and Sheridan Noelani Inamoto, as well as Alex, I believe. Um, and they'll be sharing some songs with us. They are uh, Kanaka Maoli, which is Native, Native Hawaiian. And uh, they are also recognized as Young war Warriors, Kioi. And they are working to protect sacred sites uh, all throughout the lands from Mauna Kea to uh, their home territories here and the Ohlone territory where we are um, with Karina and her relatives. Thanks so much, Najoni. And so right before we go to our, our wonderful uh, young warriors, I just wanted to let folks know that Mauna Kea is the tallest peak in Hawaii. Just giving uh, for just a little bit of background information uh, and also throughout Mauna Nui, Mauna Kea is the, the highest peak. And the proposed site of an enormous uh, observatory known as the 30 meter, a meter telescope or the TMT. 
It's an 18-story massive structure or equal to six football fields. Um, the, the, the mountain is known as home to Wakea, the sky god, who, who partnered with Papaha Naumoku, or the earth goddess, and also is the territory of the revered female deity, Poliahu. They have, and these wonderful kiai or protectors in native Hawaiian language uh, have been fighting for the protection of Mauna Kea for over two decades. So thank you so much, young warriors, for being here with us today. Hi everyone, mahalo. Thank you for inviting us, um, Auntie Fui, um, and aloha, Auntie Karina, and really awesome to be here with all of you. And uh, really grateful to be, um, be able to share and that was just an awesome introduction about Mauna Kea. Um, but I do want to uh, offer uh, an oli or a chant that was written by Auntie or Kumupua Case. And it is an offering that talks about a canoe. It's actually also a favorite of the Winnemawintu, who are also mm -hmm. um, very much a part of Boyan You know, mountains are all connected, right? And sacred places. They know each other. Um, but it's, a, it's an only that was written for Hokulea. And it's a double hull voyaging canoe that actually sailed around the world and took three years without modern instruments or anything, but they did it. And so I wanted, I chose this only not only to honor Antipua Case, who's a huge mentor and inspiration for me and Kiai with her family, but also um, to give us hope and to know that it's very possible. But the key is that um, when, we, when we paddle together, we have success. We will arrive. We can't do it without each other. So here we go. So I'm gonna offer this for all of you. Aloha and mahalo. Awe wahiti e wahiti e hokule ae. Awe uahi tie Hele kava ai ke kai e Ho o kele va ala i noe A o he pulu va anui e Awe uahi tie E lau hoi mai kava ai ke ka I ka hoe, I ka hoe, I ke ka E pai aku i ka aina la E pai mai la i ka aina e Aue, ua hiti e Thank you so much, uh, 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 Sister Sheridan uh, Noelani. Keone, you also have Anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd also like to, to share another meta. Um, also uh, imposed by the book case um, called Melon and Mai. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Kenny Rodriguez. Um, yeah, just Melon Mahalo. Um, you know, the Olona people and their people and their ancestors um, that. The Olona territory is, is the one that has sustained me and has been um, my place of residence for um, a lot of the past year. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, where I currently live on my AI territory, also known as San Diego. Um, and so now I'll share Malana Mai. Malana Mai actually has a similar uh, theme to Awe Hitie in that um, it's sort of a song of gathering all of the districts of Hawaii Island, which is the island that Mauna Kea is on. Um, and so it names all these districts and um, calls them together to you know, sort of paddle in that same canoe um, and work towards, work towards justice um, and work towards the, the betterment of our people. Um, and that, you know, it goes even beyond Hawaii and Hawaii Island, but uh, to all of our sacred sites all across the world, um, our mountains connect us, the ocean connects us. Um, so here's Melanomai. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kia'i, San Francisco Bay Area, Kia'i, for your important work throughout here, the, throughout the Bay Area, and inspiring all of us to be Kia'i and to stand alongside Kanaka Maoli in this important work to protect the sacred. I'm just wondering, Inez, is it possible that you could put up the photograph of the ceremony, the reasons why I wanted that image to be shown? But the image, it actually shows the relationships that the, the work of protecting the sacred is a, is a work of building relationships uh, from those of us from Moana Nui with our relatives from Turtle Island, including our relatives, of course, from Australia and all around the world, including Africa. I say this also because I know that many of our brothers and sisters are, are, are tuning into this program from all around the world. I really wanna, in the photo, the photo shows also our sacred relationship and with um, Free West Papua, with our brothers and sisters in the Papua Liberation Movement. Also, our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who are protecting Yihu Matau. Also, the relationships with, that we have with our brothers and sisters who are fighting on the front lines for the liberation movements in Kashmir. So these relationships, always to protect the sacred, is a decolonial work. That as our sister Lawani Till also says, this is the work where we see each other. When, the, when white supremacy and when the US empire refuses to see us, this is the work that we do is that we recognize each other by standing for the sacred. And as you said in your beautiful offering, um, Noelani, that this is the work like, uh, as Kumupua Case, one of our, our important leaders at this time, that the work is done collective, that the building of canoes, that the voyaging, that the works of building relationalities is a work that we in Moana Nui and other indigenous people throughout the world know. This is a collective work. It is never an individual work. So thank you so much, young warriors. Thank you so much. And Karina Gold as well. Thank you for your leadership. This was done on, uh, this ceremony was actually, it was done with you as one of the leaders and on your, the, the sacred side of your people, the West Berkeley Shao Mound um, here in Huchen. So brothers and sisters who are joining us today, we wanna, again, we wanna thank you with an open heart. Um, as Tongans, we would always begin by saying, um, meaning our hearts are humbled and our hearts are on the ground. As Tongans, when we come to an empire, especially an empire like the US, with militarization, what we do as Tongans when we say is we're showing you our mana, our greatest power. Our greatest power is always located in the land. It is in our sacred. And for us people from Moana Nui, it's always located within our, God, excuse me, our grandmother, our beloved grandmother, our Moana. So brothers and sisters, before we begin the conversation, I really wanna show my, my deepest gratitude to our sister, Lisa Tiny Gray Garcia, who's gonna be on our, uh, one of our speakers today, also to our brother, Klee Benali. Malotha pato ki lalo. Bakuatu henya ae, Afrika malo ma olunga. With deepest gratitude, brothers and sisters, for joining us in this conversation. 
thank you not only for the great work that you're doing as front line, on the front line to save our indigenous peoples and communities and also our poor peoples and communities. Thank you also for being part of this conversation. So our, our young sister, Najoni Brown, is also going to read your bios before we begin, and then we'll begin with the first question. Hello again. So I'm um, honored to introduce these two revolutionary people in our communities. Um, so today we have Klee from Deneta, the Navajo Nation. He's a musician, as well as a traditional dancer, filmmaker, and is currently organizing uh, in response to um, the, the craziness that's been caused by COVID-19 or COVID-19. So organizing responses, including Indigenous Mutual Aid and organizing funds for the Navajo and Hopi Relief Fund. He's also representing the Bitterwater Clan Totochini. And we have Lisa as well, afro Boricua storyteller from Hu Chin. She has written over 200 stories and is a, recognized as a poverty scholar and has also founded a school with her mother, Mama D. She's also co-founded and launched the project Homefulness in the deep east of Huchen, present day Oakland. Thank you for joining us today. Klee, the Navajo Nation currently has the highest per capita rate of confirmed positive coronavirus cases in the US, more than any state and more than New York. Klee, can we ask you for an update, please? And then we're going to go on to you, Tani. Yat et asin flo, she klee, dash a jinne, todi cheatney, shabash, she not could in it, dash another, shema e, baith a cheat, auto, baith a cheat, dash a che, tithlijin de nasha, auto, confun, shaho one. My name is Klee Benali, originally from Black Mesa on the Dene Navajo Nation. Currently, I reside in Flagstaff, which is at the base of the holy San Francisco peaks, as we call this sacred holy mountain. The Kosli, which is uh, holy to 13 indigenous nations. And I just want to acknowledge before I respond to the question, the connections that we've had with Karina, of course, with Sigurate Land Trust. I was out there at the initial occupation to protect Sigurate, and y'all supported us when we were in court in the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco during um, the uh, trials to protect our holy mountain from ski area development and snowmaking with treated sewage. And so um, there's not really much to update regarding the impacts because it is escalating. We have not reached um, a plateau of cases. As you mentioned, um, we have the highest per capita rate of COVID-19 cases in the, the so-called U.S. when you compare it to states. And this is a, a big challenge, but something that's important to understand in context. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the environmental context and the impacts regarding our health um, and why we may be more susceptible, but I also want to just talk about the radical mutual aid work and very powerful movement that's happening. And I think that's the most significant component of the updates that I can provide right now, um, especially because uh, we've been mobilized for over two months now. I, I'm a partner. I work with directly with the Navajo Hopi families. COVID-19 relief effort and fund, which was started by uh, my relative Ethel Branch in, on March 15th. It initially was started with a GoFundMe that since has raised over three and a half million dollars. Um, and every week we're doing multiple distribution drops all throughout Dinepakea or the Navajo Nation, uh, where we're providing at least uh, about a hundred thousand, the goal is a hundred thousand uh, dollars worth of supplies um, uh, every week. Um, and so it's just, you know, escalated in something that we have been uh, empowering uh, a range of different community members, people who have been doing this kind of work for many, gener many generations. Um, and uh, I'm also working with a group called Kintlana Mutual Aid that we started on March 14th, um, which is centralized around the so-called Flagstaff area. So we're basically doing mutual aid work throughout the whole region as well. Um, and then most recently, um, last month, we, I worked with a group of folks to start indigenousmutualaid.org. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. But um, really, I think the most important thing to understand is, is that we are facing crisis upon crisis. That COVID-19, the, the, the crisis, this crisis is a crisis of capitalism and colonialism. And that when we face crisis like this or, or um, especially in our communities, um, 
COVID-19 is just enhancing or magnifying a crisis that already exists with resource colonialism and the direct attacks on our people's health and well-beings. Um, we have a methane cloud the size of Delaware hanging above the four corners, the so-called four corners area on the Navajo Nation, because there are two massive coal-fired power plants that have been um, destroying our air uh, and compromising our immune systems. There are reports recently that came out of Harvard and there were studies done in Italy about the way that um, uh, our health is more susceptible uh, in areas where there have been great sig or significant impacts of air pollution. Um, and so uh, this is something that when we look at our area, we have over 523 abandoned uranium mines. The EPA has closed more than 22 wells. Um, that means 50, about 50,000 of our um, folks don't have access to those water sources. Um, and then you look at the range of other statistics that we have uh, about 33% of our uh, residents on our reservation, which is the largest land-based reservation. Uh, it is what, roughly the size of so-called West Virginia. Um, we have about 200,000 plus uh, residents uh, on our homelands and about 33% of them don't have access to running water and electricity. Um, but I also, in that, um, I think it's really important to address that there's been a lot of um, poverty, uh, sort of crisis tourism or voyeurism regarding that, and our people are not victims. When you look at those statistics, it's because capitalist expansion hasn't been fulfilled in our communities. We have a lot of remote elders that have been living subsistence lifestyles off that so-called grid. Um, and it's not because we're bad capitalists and it's not, you know, the, the, the crisis isn't that we don't have big box um, corporate stores on every street corner. The crisis is, is that our ways of life, our ability to feed our people, our traditional um, subsistence lifestyles, our livestock, our cornfields, our waterways, our air um, has all been systematically attacked by Resource, um, by forces of resource colonialism and facilitated by capitalism. And so this has been a direct attack on our abilities even to feed ourselves healthy food. Um, we only have about 13 grocery stores that serve that whole entire area um, of Dinepike or the Navajo Nation. And so this is a scarcity issue. It's a resource uh, scarcity issue, one that you know our people are forced to go off the reservation, sometimes up to 200 miles round trip to access resources in so-called border towns like Flagstaff or uh, Gallup, New Mexico, Farmington. Um, and as you know, you may know, Gallup, New Mexico shut down recently with a riot control order, essentially if effecti effectively making it a police state. Um, but ultimately, there's an extreme uh, history of racism in these border towns. Up until the 1960s, they had signs that said no Indians or dogs allowed. There's been uh, capitalist sort of restrictions and gatekeeping, and that's essentially what this order in Gallup is at this point, because um, we have effectively a re, uh, weekend curfews um, enforced by the Navajo Nation that are 50, 57 hours. Um, people face fines, they face jail time if they're outside of their, their, their homes, um, other than emergency or essential reasons. And so shutting down a place like Gallup um, for, for a whole week and, and the weekends restricts people's access to get supplies that aren't, they might not be able to access um, in our own communities. And so this is just a picture, I guess, of the crisis that we're facing. And again, it's a crisis upon crises. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kalini. I think to myself, how do I respond to that? And um, I guess what I mean by uh, respond, it's not that I have a, uh, that I need a response. I, I guess what I'm just trying to say, uh, Brother Klee, is uh, how touched, how touched, how touched we are with the, with the information that you're telling us. Not only does it break our heart, and I also want to, want to hold that for so many of our listeners as well, that we're also in a deep state of mourning. The capitalism, um, U.S. settler colonialism is not just a virus that began this year. That as you're saying, this is a historical, historical um, endeavor. This is part of the building of the U.S. empire and the, the expansion. So thank you so much. Thank you for your, your great work and thank you for that important history as well. 
Sister, Sister Tiny, you give us a little bit of uh, update on, on the work that you're doing here in Huchen on the front lines. Uh, this week also, you and our good sister, uh, Dr. Rupa Myra, who was on our show last week, her as well as our wonderful sister, Kanaka Maui, Native Hawaiian sister, Kanaka Maui sister, uh, Dr. Niheu, uh, Kalama Alkaina Niheu, talked about uh, the importance, again, the importance of um, working in collaborations, but also connecting the dots to colonialisms and also what's happening at the present moment. And so Sister Tiny, why don't you give us a little bit of update, please? I am that poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter, and the poverty scholar, all those people you don't want to see, never want to be, look away from me. What you gonna do, arrest me? We're in your city. I'm a poverty scholar and I rock my jailhouse attire. Not because orange is the new black. Don't believe that Hollywood crack. It's because me and my poor mama did jail time for the poverty crime of being unhoused in this occupied indigenous holler. So I have to start with poetry because as a, a person who has a sixth grade formal institution uh, learning uh, and a PhD in poverty, um, that's the other way that I teach through verse. Um, one of my heroes and she heroes is, um, is a man named Patachiva uh, who didn't go to school beyond the third grade and was uh, able to organize thousands of Brazilian indigenous workers uh, to rise up against the wealth hoarders. The wealth hoarders. Um, so I'm just, right now, I'm actually really, really heavy with um, the pain. And so thank you for your tears, Fui, and for your beautiful prayer, Karina and Sheridan and the brother as well from Huichina and Hawaii and, and, and Klee. Um, yeah, just holding in my heart um, the struggle of our, of our folks. Um, and to let you all know that I, I sit also and bring in my mama for without whom there be no me, Afroboricua sister who was uh, tortured in these foster homes and orphanages and yeah. Uh, as brother said, that did not begin with COVID-19. What I often say is that this is also the virus called poverty, um, right? And, uh, and going even further, the virus called capitalism. Uh, I like to mess with the colonial words because they're not, they're not our tongue anyway, right? Um, so the brutality of the, of the virus, as, as Klee pointed out, is just la layering on something that was already there. Um, today I bring to you, uh, if, if, if within the context of the update, um, the politrickster in charge in occupied Yalamu, aka Gentrification City, aka Frisco, uh, the new device is to build open air cages for unhoused people. Um, and I'm not exaggerating. Now, for those of you who don't know, again, this didn't start in, uh, with COVID-19 in occupied Seminole territory as myself and brother Leroy and Auntie Francis and Dee from Poor Magazine family witnessed, uh, they already have open air cages for unhoused bodies and people and lives where you check in at 7 p.m. and you don't leave until the next morning and you're outside in a cage. Um, well, a lot of people only thought that that was happening to indigenous refugee babies from the other side of the false borders, but no, Arpaio and his evil and all of the other people who think they own Mama Earth and they own these map, lines on a map and all these other fake colonial uh, narratives uh, have been trying out their, um, their evil on houseless people. If people don't know that before Arpaio started what he did in, um, in Arizona with people from the other side of the false borders. He tried it out in Phoenix by first burning down all the poor people housing in that town, AKA SROs, and then building containment zones for houseless folks where he threw up um, barriers at 11 o'clock at night, keeping everybody in an area to essentially kill themselves. Uh, and then letting them out, you know, at eight in the morning if they still lived. And so these, these, um, this colonial virus and, and these violence uh, is consistent and constant and never changed. And sometimes I think now is just more nuanced. You know, um, 
people were all about it's almost like they wanted uh the 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 Dane, the the killer cheeto in the white people's house to put martial law in because i don't know why but anyway he did it which i think was one of the only things that that person did that i was happy about but it was funny people always wanted him to right but but that still that still happens and actually it's just it's just more um under on the under right um so what we have going on for instance in las vegas as i think people heard is that you know they kicked all the houseless people out of the sh the one shelter they have in that occupied territory so-called las vegas stolen land um and then put them in parking lots well the same thing is happening in frisco um basically there's a containment zone in downtown san francisco otherwise known as the tl tenderloin and that's the only people only place where houseless people get to be um if you're in the occupied mission district which used to be a black and brown neighborhood until it was became a hipster enclave for tech workers the gentry tech nation um you can't even sit or stand while houseless uh, they threw up barriers around all the bart stations where elders convene um, one of the many things that happens about all poor people of all colors and all nations is that we no longer are seen as human. Uh, now we're equated with trash. And so hygienic metaphors are used about our bodies. Uh, concepts like sweeps and cleaning up are used casually about places and spaces where poor people dwell, sit, stand, and convene. Um, and it's an odd thing. You know, it's that whole weird, like Nazi thing. If you say something enough, people become acquainted and comfortable with it, right? So you've got people who are sort of even so-called conscious saying things like cleaning up, um, right? And really what that is, is you're talking about humans and that certain humans are seen as dirty, right? Inherently, uh, or even worse, if we happen to be without a roof, um, trash. So out here in occupied Khalifa Saslan and, and most of the US, but definitely here, you have uh, this concept called sweeps. Um, and basically what that actually means is anything from power washing humans with 50 mile an hour water and, and chemicals, which is still happening and even more with COVID, um, to actual uh, DPW trucks, which is the, you know, the trash trucks taking our belongings. And when I say belongings, I always break this down because I want people who happen to have roofs to understand the nuances of this. So I don't use words like belongings. I'm talking about the family photos of your mama. Like in my case, I don't even have one. I have one picture entirely because all of them were taken in sweeps. Um, your best, memento that you have of you know maybe something you had as a baby or your child's baby uh pictures these are the things that are taken as well as walkers for disabled elders on and on the list goes thrown in trash trucks and taken away as well as medicine pharmaceuticals we cannot afford to rebuy and on and on the list goes our tents which are our roofs which brings up this whole concept of how do you shelter in place when you don't have a place, um, are still taken in the place the so-called called Sacramento, where our brothers and sisters, Crystal Rose Sanchez, shout out and homeless union warriors and sack soup um, are out on the street every day. Uh, they're still taking people's belongings. They're still taking people's place, AKA 10. And what has happened is that we get so cold that we burn ourselves up, not intentionally, but if you've ever been that cold, like I have, uh, and woken up the next morning with your calf attached to uh, a space heater, you understand a different kind of notion of cold. Anyway, this is happening. This week, um, because we're cultural workers and poets and writers and media producers, as well as houseless people, uh, a group of us launched um, a, uh, a documentary film on the impact of COVID-19 on the multi-billion dollar tourist industry. And um, we sent out a press release and that's all we said. 
let's just say we didn't tell the whole story yet because you know we weren't getting it all out there right yet. Um, <laughs> so a famous Mexica filmmaker, indigenous brother, uh, who's part of our, our, our family and is currently houseless in San Francisco um, by the name of Jesus Sandoval, although that's not his, uh, his, given, his uh, given name, his paper name, but it's his art name. He launched it and we were his entourage and we, um, you know, as any entourage needs to, we needed to get rooms for our entourage. And so we went to one of the 1% hotels in downtown San Francisco, the Marriott, uh, one of the elite institutions where they don't pay their workers properly and where um, they never have and where they, ra they uh, rent rooms to the tune of eight to hundred to a thousand dollars a night. The hotel was empty. We walked in and uh, when they thought we were, you know, folks with money, right? Hipster filmmakers. Uh, they were about showing us rooms. They cut us a deal, three rooms for three nights at $200. It's like, whoa, can't rent a bathroom at that place for $200, what? And so uh, when Jesus said he needed to see the room before he uh, paid for it, because he had an aesthetic, you know, like all filmmakers do, uh, the manager of the entire hotel escorted us upstairs, me and Jesus. When we got there and we looked around and we saw room after room with nobody in it, locked up like uh, a, a jewel. It, it was absolutely terrifying. But anyway, we got into the room, the one room, because they only have two floors open. And he said, we can show you all kinds of rooms, never to make you happy. Anyway, we got in and we sat down and we said, actually, we're not leaving because we have nowhere to go. We're houseless people. At that point, they um, threatened us with arrest. They said, you have one minute to leave. We brought it, they brought in the armies called the police. And of course, because we're poor people and he's from the other side of the false borders, we absolutely can't get arrested. I have a record personally, I can't. So we left, we were escorted downstairs by a gun toting armies, we're met by 20 more polis in the lobby. And we left in peace as we came. Uh, but as he left, we left, the manager uh, reminded me, he said, what you did was a crime. It was like going into a restaurant and not paying for the bill. And I said, no, actually, sir, you're wrong. What you're doing right now is a crime because you're hoarding these hotel rooms when people are dying on the street right outside. I'll stop there because I could go on. You and Klee. And the many families, the many communities, the ancestors as well from the past. And at this present moment as well. So I want to return, I, I want to ask a question that returns actually to, to a question you already posed, uh, uh, Klee. I wanted to ask both of you because you both do work to protect the sacred. How was your work, your, your work of mutual aid, of radical uh, redistribution? How is this so different than perhaps what we call here in this country as charity? Mm. <laughs> Go ahead, Clee. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I've, 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 given, I've given this a lot of work and a lot of thought. I'll just sort of like, jump in and maybe share a little bit of what I've written and then um, maybe some images. Um, but uh, Indigenous Mutual Aid is not just about redistributing resources, it's about radical redistribution of power to restore our life ways, heal our communities and the land. So where do we get our power from? We get our power from the land and the sources, Mother Earth is not a resource, it's the source of our life. So these sacred places are key to the balance with our cosmology as indigenous people. That's why this, this connection, this connection point, especially talking about these issues is really key and critical because folks who have been doing on the front lines protecting these sites, we understand what the sacred duty and responsibilities and obligations we have as those traditional knowledge keepers or those who are working with our traditional medicine practitioners understand that. Um, so I think one of the key points here is, is that, you know, we can talk all we want about bringing our people up and um, each other up, but how far can we really get if we're not tearing the system down? 
because this isn't the first virus that indigenous people have faced. Our ancestors have survived before through um, biological warfare attacks from the measles, smallpox, infected blankets, the influenza epidemic of 1918, um, when an estimated 2,000 Dine uh, perished. And so, you know, we have long been familiar with the colonial strategy of strategies of biological warfare, um, and that also translates to the attacks on our food systems. I and mean, we have an extreme epidemic of um, uh, diabetes and folks who face or are afflicted with diabetes are more susceptible to COVID-19. You know, there's a correlation there regarding the systemic, systematic attacks on our food systems and how that's been used, how, how actually starvation has been weaponized by colonizers to, to attack our people, to make them more dependent on these colonial ways of life. You know, some estimates state that approximately 20 million indigenous people may have died in the, um, the years following the first wave of U European invasion due to these diseases. Um, so we have many lessons within our ways in who our teachings and our ancestry. And a lot of that is actually within the prophecies and the medicine that we carry with us. Um, you know, the, the, from the long walk um, that impacted Diné uh, in, the 19, in 1964, we were um, forcibly marched to a concentration camp called Fort Sumner, where our um, systematically we fa we faced uh, scorched earth campaigns by uh, Colonel Kit Carson operating with the U.S. military, who basically raised our field, slaughtered our lives into um, submission and then onto a long walk to a concentration camp called Fort Sumner where our diet was completely shifted and changed. Um, but within that, um, and, and along that time, there were many um, prophecies and understandings um, that, were, that were made with our people. And we have gone through different worlds before. Uh, we have um, witnessed and experienced uh, the transition of worlds. And I think part of the challenge that we face is that with dominant um, settler colonial society is, is that it's a, it's a linear frame of mind and way of being. There's a beginning, middle, and end. And especially when you look at a Christianized context from that perspective, you know, the, the, the logical conclusion of that way of thinking and being is apocalypse. But for indigenous people, those who are connected with the land, um, our ways of being in understandings is cyclical. We understand the cycles. We've been through different cycles before. And so when we are in line, when we connect with these sacred places, we understand the disharmony, the space between harmony and disharmony, um, and what the potential consequences are, we see that global warming is not just the greatest threat facing humanity. And if we all just recycle better, then it will, will be better. It's not just about greenwashing our ways of life or redwashing our ways of life. It's actually about understanding the choices that we've made and the consequences of a war, a system that is based on the war against Mother Earth that has consequences, that has set this imbalance upon this, this, this world. Um, even when we were fighting to protect the Holy San Francisco peaks from ski area um, expansion and snowmaking with treated sewage, our medicine people said there's prophecies here that if the mountain is disturbed, then that will bring great disharmony uh, and disease to our people. That was made clear with, the, with our medicine practitioners. They foresaw this disharmony, and this has been something that is in within our teachings. So we have medicine um, to, to address this. We have our ancestors, our teachings, and as indigenous people, we have to look to that, um, especially in this time. You know, we have, and I think it's important to address mutual aid. It's not a new concept. It's not a concept that was, you know, created by Kropotkin or anarchists in, in the 19, early 1900s. It's something that even Kropotkin recognized in his book, Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution, is, is that, you know, he, in his studies with the natural environment and indigenous peoples, um, that we have long practiced that. And it was an argument actually against these, these competitive and, and uh, violent dominating ways of being. And this is something that we have to come back to. And we have a powerful opportunity um, to, in this time, you know, our, our, our prophecies, again, warned us of the consequences of violating, violating Mother Earth. Our ways of being have guided us through the endings of world, worlds before. So we listen now more than ever to our ancestors in the land and our medicine carriers in these times that we can care for each other more fiercely than ever. We're living really in a time of prophecy in this system that 
precipitated this disharmony will not lead us through or out of it. Um, you know, they will only craft new changes, chains and cages for us. As the sickness ravages our lands, we have to ask ourselves, will we continue to allow this empire, these systems, capitalism, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, to recuperate themselves? You know, we, we around here in the so-called Southwest, we've grown up in a world of ruins. You know, a lot of tourists come through and they go to these ruins and they take pictures of them. Um, but we have teachings and prophecies of the endings of these cycles that um, this is how it's always been here in this world of harmony and dis disharmony. We teach this as hojon and anage, which is the, the, the way of balance or the, the beauty way, as some people call it. And anaja is a protection way. We carry those things with us. And so an anti-colonial and anti-capitalist uh, world already actually exists. Um, and this is something that my father says, he's a traditional medicine practitioner, Hatathli. He says, there's not two worlds, a uh, traditional modern world. It's one world crossed by many different paths. Um, so these colonial and capitalist paths are linear by design. And if that path of greed, domination, exploitation, and competition that has precipitated this crisis doesn't accept that it's reached its dead end, then we have to make sure of it. So again, we can talk all about, you know, bringing our people up um, through mutual aid work, but um, how far are we going to get if we're not tearing the system down? And that's a lot of the work that we're focused on in this area is making sure that, you know, we assert that indigenous mutual aid is necessary uh, because the, the unique um, teachings that we have and the, um, uh, the context that we have as well. Thank you so much. Malo, Malo, uh, Queen. Malo, Malo, Malo. Sister Tiny, I think about 2011, this is how we first met, and also uh, with our sister Karina Gold, was at the Ohlone Sacred Site. Uh, we were standing alongside our relatives um, to help them to protect their sacred sigurite. Yes. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to reconnect with you, sister. Sister Tiny, in what ways, in what ways do indigenous or ancestral knowledges and teachings uh, shape the work that you do? The radical redistribution and indigenous mutual aid mm. that you, so that you, that you are on the front lines of this COVID-19. Ashe. That you do. Ashe. Anthropology, ethnography, psychology, the study about us, without us. Our spirits, our cultures, our traditions through your lens, deconstructing our struggle while our communities are dismantled and left in rubble. So uh, yeah, you know, I, I've got to bring my verse in there and uh, that's a longer piece. Um, and I just want to lift up the fact that, you know, your medicine and, and mm -hmm. Sister Karina and so many more is in the Poverty Scholarship book. What? Us poor people have our own theory. Um, like Clee was right. saying, right? Um, while we talk about bringing up we actually have to build and i think that um you know the whole point of us creating this this book uh poor people poverty scholarship poor people led theory art words and tears across mama earth is that guess what us poor folks from all four corners have our own knowledge uh our own epistemologies and even god forbid our own theory and it has nothing to do with a, a eugenicist backed institution right um, so I want to lift that up as we as we have bring this concept of radical redistribution because myself and Clee were kind of face crack laughing over the way that all of a sudden everybody's in the pool talking this mutual aid mess. Um, and you know, no disrespect. I know everybody's heart is real. And I always, you know, I might be a little salty today, but I always come with love. So <laughs> wherever you come from. And one of the things I say, and I know that you all know this, and this is what we live by. I don't teach anything that I don't walk. And this is very real uh, because I think that's part of the ways, right? That we fight the hypocrisy every day in America KKK, um, which is so real. But one of the things is that, uh, you know, the revolution will not be melted in a pot. That we all walk to spirit from different places. Uh, one of the things that AKK Demia never understands is the way that spirit must be enmeshed with indigenous peoples and arguably uh, all poor peoples from all four corners, right? Because that's one of the ways that we organize, quote unquote. That's one of the ways that we activate. 
And more importantly, that's the one of the ways that we stay alive. Um, is our connection to Mother Earth, our connection to Moana Nui, to the ocean, to Mama Ocean, to Father Sky, to all of these ways, right? And that we all come from different places to spirit. Um, that the same way, you know, sometimes even different indigenous communities, uh, they throw shade on folks who, who practice in the, in the colonizer church. And I have to ask, humbly ask my sisters and brothers, I get it and I understand the anger and that some of our our, you know, our most beautiful indigenous people were colonized so much that that's where they still practice spirit. And that we have to get over these uh, internalized oppression politics as well, uh, that we're putting down each other. That isn't the way for liberation, right? The liberation is to lift up. And so when we first came to to this beautiful work and had the blessing of meeting you and Karina and right and Sigourte and standing with all of us and you all to lift up that sacred site and not let the, the, the Vallejo Recreation and Parks Department desecrate for more re recreate, right? Um, we, we began the process of realizing that we, to do this work to really, you know, actually operate in interdependence rather than the cult of independence which is hammered into us in the americlan uh state of individuation and white supremacy uh none of it can happen none of that heteropatriarchal uh informed therapy industrial complex none of that institutionalization none of that prison industrial complex don't get it twisted family without the concept that is all rooted in about three or four old white men, uh, the heteropatriarchal uh, Western industrial therapy complex of individuation, the normalcy of separation nation, as I call it. It enables us to forget who built us, who informed us, who poured into us, where we have our sacred languages and our sacred burial grounds. It, enabled indigenous black and brown and all colors of all nations to cross false borders and forget everyone and everything they are from. You cannot do it unless you buy into the separation nation. You can't do capitalism unless you believe in the cult of independence. So as we talk about mutual aid, we have to unpack what is interdependence and how ever did helping your brother and sister, your mama, your grandmama, your auntie, your uncle, and the brother next door, how did that become a commodity? How did that get turned into the charity industrial complex? How did we start believing in elder ghettos and the concept of all of these lies, the age grade separated schools and the notion of, 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 of people who have nothing to do with us teaching us, uh, people who have nothing to do with us archiving us and, and doing what my brother Klee says, a beautiful thing of, of, of making ruins of all of our sacred. So as we did that process, right, of realizing we needed to unsell Mama Earth, as houseless people, we are not, many of us aren't, aren't, uh, this is not our ancestral territory. Matter of fact, none of us. We come from all four corners, but we're all houseless on this occupied land. And so what we knew very clearly after we had the blessing of learning from Sister Karina, from you, Fui, from all of the beautiful warriors at Sigorte and many more places and my mama and beyond, is that to actually build homefulness, which was a dream of Mama D while we we're still sleeping in bus shelters and park benches and anywhere we could maybe get a little bit of rest as a houseless mama and daughter, was that we needed to resist the cult of separation and build actual community back and take it back. I say all that to say, fast forward uh, to 2011 and we started to teach young people with race and class privilege about radical redistribution about the notion that they actually had to stop practicing the violent act of looking away. There's a lot more there, it's a whole other call. But at that point, we asked permission of you and Karina and specifically of the Scorte and, uh, I mean of the Lashana Ohlone peoples to bring prayer and ask if we could begin the concept of homefulness right here in Occupied Uchin. 
um, after Karina began to be part of our family elders and walk with us, and we began that process, we knew that to not operate like colonizers means that you actually always operate within your honor. And so we launched Humbleness with Interdependence, and we started the Sliding Scale Cafe. We started Decolonize Academy. We started the Revolutionary Radio right here on this small piece of Mama Earth. We housed the first four families who were houseless, my son and my and myself included. And all that to say, fast forward to COVID-19. The lines around the block for the free food were already there, family. Don't get it twisted, because that colonial virus called poverty was already in effect. But with COVID-19, they got worse. So now we're feeding up to 700 people on the street in Frisco, in Oakland, in Occupied Wichita out here in Black Arthur. And people are lining up in the morning at 7 a.m. to get supplies, to get masks, to get hand sanitizer, to get food. No, that's not something to celebrate. That's something to mourn. And we stand with you, Maokaunga uh, Mamahi. We stand with you in this time of mourning, as well as you, uh, Brother Klee, and for ourselves too as well for our own families and for our own communities as well. You know, brothers and sisters, I really apologize to be the, the, the timekeeper of this Western time. I always say this, if we were back in the Pacific, this conversation would go on with Gaba around a cover bowl. Uh, we would be drinking Kava maybe for the next three days. And this conversation would go on. We would have a lot of food and, and sing and dance. But in this conversation, we're, we're restrained again by uh, Western time. This is this conversation ends at 7.30. We might be a little bit late. And we're going to bring in uh, Cor Karina Gould. Karina, you also had a question. You had a question that you wanted to offer to our, our warriors today. I don't know how we're going to get to this question in a quick in, um, time, but I wanted to ask you if you could um, just offer up um, for what would be your dream for the next seven generations, your prayer for the next seven generations going forward from here? Um, and yeah, that's a big question, but maybe you can just put a little bit on that, you know? Just a cherry. <laughs> Hold it a little bit. You got to hit that, <laughs> you gotta hit that <laughs> question <laughs> first, Tiny. No, family, go for it. <laughs> I mean, I can, but I, I, I want to defer to you, family. Yeah, um, there's so much to address here, but it's um, returning to those cycles, uh, restoring and remembering, reconnecting, and then moving forward with our traditional cultural knowledge systems, not backwards. You know, this is, you know, indigenous liberation has to happen on indigenous terms. Um, you know, we can fight against the range of systems of oppressions, but if we're just doing land acknowledgements uh, and that's as far as we go, then it, it's, it's superficial. It doesn't actually mean anything. And so we have a very unique and powerful opportunity while this system is very weak. And we look at the infrastructure that this system is built upon and how vulnerable it is. What ways can we intervene in that and make sure that our future generations have healthy water, cl clean air, uh, and, and land that will produce crops and seeds that aren't modified, um, that pollute our bodies further, and foods that destroy our, our, our immune systems and health. And so th that, that vision is, is an old vision, but it's one that we carry forward like a fire. And so we gather around this fire and we ask, who is with us? You know, not just to hand out but to stand together side by side. And I, I wrote a zine a while back called Accomplices Not Allies. And I highly recommend folks looking to that because we address this whole you know, dynamic of charity and white savior uh, mentality and people rushing to try to save people. That's not what mutual aid is about. That's why with indigenousmutualaid.org, we say uh, solidarity. Uh, we don't just say solidarity, not charity. We say solidarity and ceremony, not charity. Because in our organizing, in our planning, in all of our work, our culture is our first framework for action. And so as long as we have that, we're carrying forward that powerful legacy of our ancestors for our future generations. So we're part of that right now. So it's not just about survival. I know, you know, we could say whatever cliches we want about thriving and resilience and all of that. 
but it's about maintaining that fire, that sacred fire, and bringing that forward. Yeah. Ooh, um, yeah, ditto to what you said, Klee. And I, I just, I guess what I would like to add is that um, the concept of, of, of unselling and I don't, I know I hate to swear in, 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 in a mixed company, but ungentrifying, excuse my French, <laughs> um, really all of mama earth, right? Um, that I feel though that what's interesting in this time, and I, and I actually have heard Karina speak about this a few times, that this is that moment, right? Where people with the desperation of the colonial virus has become more obvious, right? It's as you said, Clee, it's, and all of us know, this is nothing new, but it's become more obvious, right? And in that, in that moment, um, I feel like there's this little tiny opening for some kind of truth to get slightly out. Um, and so what's happened is in people's despair and desperation, um, you know, either, let's be real, either two things happen, they become more hateful and more insane, if you will, um, or they just become slightly more opened. And so I guess what my dream at this moment and the seven generations and the youth that we're bringing up as we speak right now, just walk past us and decolonize Academy is uh, that they, that this next seven generations works to unsell mama earth that, yeah, you know, there will never, as mama earth knows, you know, she will continue fine just without us. Right. If we're lucky enough to stay, on her uh, for any period of time. We have to operate differently um, en masse. And so in this way uh, that more people learn about poverty scholarship, uh, that more people learn about walking softly on mama earth, that more people understand uh, that hoarding and cluttering uh, of the 1% can't happen. I always have to give my parable of Poor people are called hoarder clutterers because we keep too many socks or cardboard boxes. Uh, but how does Jeff Bezos not be considered a hoarder with five condominiums that he can never stay in and four cars that he could never drive in, right? And so that we start to unpack the lies of the wealth hoarders and the land stealers and that we continue to lift up the prayers of our ancestors from all four corners and that we lift up these young leaders uh, in the way that we're trying to do. And I know Klee, you do as well, and all of us and Fui and the beautiful young people on here to know that there is a different way to walk on mama earth. There is a different way to activate and it has nothing to do with seeing her as a commodity uh, or extraction nation or a place of profit. So I just wanna hold up this book again and also say that, you know, this book is coming out with Klee's work in it and Karina and Fui and so many more. Uh, COVID-19, Poor People's Handbook, a survival guide through COVID-19 and the virus called poverty. And that's original art by a youth scholar, um, Celia. So yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, our futures family. And really, this conversation is that hope. So, Omateo. Omateo, Omateo. Thank you again. Um, Najoni, you, Najoni, you wanted also to come up and ask one last question before we um, do our closing ceremony of our sister, our young sister and niece, Desiree Hart. Sure, and yeah, I also wanna thank the both of you for um, you know, telling us what's going on on the front lines and for sharing those stories that need to be told. As you said, Tiny, um, people studying us without, you know, hearing directly from us, we need to tell our own stories. And you as well, Klee, like it's revealing things that have already um, been a problem for our communities. Um, and it shouldn't take a virus for people to know these, know what's going on. Um, so my question is, um, how can we stay involved and how can we support your work um, here and also in, in Navajo Nation and how can we how can we follow and support you all? So if you have any links or the best way to uh, support, go ahead, Klee. <laughs> all right, keep putting me on the spot. I um, the, so the there's an amazing, powerful movement of mutual aid spread throughout the world um, faster than this virus, uh, and in Dineta, 
it's powerful and indigenous communities because we've already practiced that. Um, and I just want to make it clear that like from my perspective, and this is part of the reason we organized indigenousmutualaid.org, and we have a fund right now where it's an emergency fund that we're providing support directly, not grants to uh, or any with any conditions except that people are actually on the front lines doing the work. Um, is is that uh, we're, we're directing funds, we're raising money um, through that effort to support them and, and help build mutual aid because this, is, this work should not be exclusive. Uh, it should not be centralized. Every city, town, rural area should have mutual aid projects and multiple ones of them because we're not here to and, and we're not here to aid, aid or salvage the heteropatriarchal white supremacist capitalist colonial social order. Um, so uh, you can check out uh, Navajo Hopi Solidarity.org. I put um, uh, the website in the chat. Also, mutual, Indigenous Mutual Aid.org and Kintlana Mutual Aid. We also have an analysis um, being published in the next couple of days on IndigenousAction.org about uh, everything I was talking about the uh, environmental racism and sort of nat national sacrifice zones and the environmental attacks and ecocide that has impacted and ma made our people more prone. Um, but I think like the, the key is just like recognizing again, like um, what we were talking about that um, this, this sort of brand of charity that um, it, many people are used to is a strategy of colonial societies to control indigenous peoples throughout the world. Um, we don't need nonprofit industry operatives trying to recuperate capitalism. This includes allies and indigenous nonprofits that are basically missionizing capitalist and colonial dependency that just starves our people from their autonomy. Um, settler and resource colonialism and capitalism have been and continue to be the crisis that has dispossessed indigenous peoples throughout the world from our very means of survival and existence. That's why we have an so many indigenous people on our on our streets here in Kinflana, and we've been mobilizing and organizing to support them. Um, so if we're really to have true solidarity and not charity on stolen lands, we must establish reciprocal, or reciprocal terms that have a deep understanding of the ongoing legacies of this colonial violence. And so, you know, I highly recommend that everybody organize, that we support and uh, rebuild indigenous food systems, farming, gardening projects in, in urban and rural areas, um, that basically we, we practice radical redistribution as scarcity hits already those living in deprivation. Um, and this also means don't call the cops if you see somebody shoplifting, you know, maybe there's a way you can uh, assist, uh, making sure that we're already, and we're already doing Doing this is that we're prioritizing those most vulnerable um, and in our organizing in our work that we're being radically intersectional that we're smashing heteropatriarchy and white supremacy in, in all of these places um, that we're, we're, we're prioritizing those most vulnerable those who can't shelter um, at home uh, those on the streets um, unsheltered and making sure that we um, do whatever we can, whether that's liberating lands, opening up uh, squats uh, and giving out tents. Any of this can be stuff that we do, we, any of us can do right now. Um, it, it means, um, you know, everything from freeing the prisons to re supporting rent strikes to building transformative and restorative justice processes into our mutual aid frameworks. So that way um, we make the cops irrelevant and in building such strong mutual aid support and network and proliferating, stabilizing and proliferating that, we make capitalism and colonialism irrelevant and we can liberate the lands through those kinds of strategies. Um, but we also have to be prepared as, as, as we move forward in this crisis, the state is going to escalate its rep repression. So how are we making sure that mutual aid is also mutual defense as well and building that into our communities, uh, our organizing frameworks as well? Because many of us never had that normal that some people are looking forward to returning to um, and to be to return to a state of normal just means renormalizing violence against um, the bodies of indigenous peoples, black folks, and, and people of color. And so, if you really mean, if especially you settlers out there, if you really mean those land acknowledgments, now is a critical time to honor indigenous peoples by disrupting colonial power relationships and un unsettling and attacking infrastructure while it's at its weakest point. And sometimes that's what mutual aid means and looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaleem. Sister Tiny? Uh, yeah, just really quickly. Um, Poor Magazine is in fact Po. <laughs> we need your dough. Uh, but how can we turn it from blood stain to love stain? That's what I'm talking about, though. So uh, 
I always say, you know, change won't come from a savior, a pimp, or an institution. Change will only come from a poor and indigenous people-led solution. Um, and I do want to, I just want to lift up all of this again tonight. It was so much healing and um, power. And thank you for this, bringing the palabra, bringing the word, the mensaje. And also um, to say that how do people survive is that um, I, I think that the key part is really um, is that we don't operate in any of the ways that capitalism puts the constraints on, right? So, um, you know, when we're talking about charity, well, you know me, I call them the philanthropists. And uh, the, you know, that we don't need those systems, so we build our own, right? And just like we're building homefulness, we're trying to homefulness the world. Um, if we unsell the world, we're homefulnessing the world. We're trying to de-gentrify Black Arthur right here in Occupied Uchin. Um, so we've created our own bank, and it has nothing to do with a bank or with a bankster. It has everything to do with radical redistribution of stolen and hoarded wealth. Um, and it's called the Bank of Community Reparations. And basically uh, what this is, is that this is conscious wealth hoarders uh, redistributing stolen and hoarded wealth uh, because they've been taught. And I do want to say that we do a thing called people school. So when you ask actually, sis, about how people can support us twice a year, uh, we do people school where it's a degentrification and decolonization seminar, two days on this occupied and, and liberated land. Um, and we teach young people with race and class privilege about how to radically redistribute and how to change and unlearn all the lies they were taught about hoarding. And so anyway, they've created this bank and what we're doing is trying to um, basically help everybody, not trying. We have the Poor Mama's Diaper Fund where we support Poor Mama's Getting. We have the, you know, the, the Mercado de Cambio Funds so we're building groceries. We have uh, money that we just give, cash money. Like, you know, I think Cleese said, you have to give cash money to people because we live in a bloodstained dollar economy. And sometimes that's all people can deal with, right? And that's real. Ain't no shame in that game. Um, and then we have the uh, Tech Reparations Fund. Uh, we haven't convinced the tech hipsters yet, but we are not stopping. It <laughs> will happen. I'm certain of it. If anybody wants to watch some of the beautiful stolen land hoarded resources tours, they're on... Uh, they're on YouTube and check them out. They're beautiful prayers. And the last one we went into Salesforce. It's quite a thing. We uh, decided to live in Salesforce. But anyway, all that to say, um, these are things are being built. People can check us out. They can actually support us with real bloodstained dollars at Poor Magazine on Venmo. Uh, you can go to www.poormagazine.org and click on Become a Revolutionary Donor. Your money doesn't go anywhere except directly to the people. If you're interested in getting involved in this and your conscious wealth order, um, there's some unlearning you have to do. Uh, the next people school is Black August 25th and 26th. And if it has to be on Zoom, it will be. Hello, oh, Sister Tiny. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, our young uh, our young sister Nijoni is going to come up. She's going to introduce our last uh, our last song, our ceremonial song for before we before we part ways, brothers and sisters. Nijoni. Hello, friends. <laughs> um, so Desiree is from the Mishawawapo uh, people as well as the Dene people, and she is a singer, songwriter, as well as an activist within the community. I also had the honor of being her mentee and working with her uh, with Snag Magazine. Um, she, she's doing a lot of great work to educate the next generation and, and also just here to bless us with her beautiful voice and prayer as well. I come from the Onatsatis people. My mother's mother is Onatsatis and my mother's father is Dene from the Nakai Dene clan. And my mountain that I was born next to is Kanamota in Mount Saint, also known as Mount Saint Helena in what is today known as Napa Valley, but we say Tsonoma, which means the, the home of, of the earth. And I just wanted to take a moment to honor all of our ancestors that we're all calling on strength from. And 
the waters and the mountains that we come from. And I also wanted to just talk about the history of where this song came from. So this song was born out of the Run for Salmon prayer journey that I helped to organize in Northern California with Auntie Karina. And this is a prayer that it connects the sacred places all across the world, including Mauna Kea and Auntie Pua has been coming. And this prayer is a prayer where we are praying for the salmon to come home, but it's also a prayer that I created for us to remember that we have the strength of the salmon inside of us and we have the ability to move up the stream together as one. And so that's really the prayer that I'm sending out right now is I'm praying that we can all have that strength of the salmon and that strength of the mountain and that we can stand as pillars and that we can allow spirit to flow through us like rivers and that those rivers can run free and be clean. And I just want to sing this song. And this is a song that I created in my Onatsaki's language. Haya kamel kao, haya kamel kao, haya kamel kao, haya kamel kao, metse Thank you. Thank you. For our second Segorite speakers uh, seating hope speaker series today. We really want to thank so much, so much gratitude, really so much gratitude and so much humility to our warrior sister, uh, Lisa Tony Frey Garcia from right here from our East Oakland. Also to our warrior brother from Navajo, Navajo territory, Cleveland Ali. We really want to thank every single one of our, our culture bearers who offered the beautiful song from our Mauna Kea, our Native Hawaiian brothers and sisters who were here earlier to offer the opening song, and to our niece, Desiree Hart, California Indian, who also offered that closing song. Brothers and sisters, our next speaker series event is going to be held on May 27th, and we invite you and your families. Before we close, we also... We also, we, we ask the great creator and our ancestors continue to bless you warriors, clean and tiny. And um, every single one of you and your families, may your families be protected and blessed at this time of pandemic. And as our warriors spoke today, may we, may we come together as well. May we use our indigenous knowledges. May we rely on our ancestors. May we 
rely on our epistemologies and our cosmologies that have saved our ancestors. Let them also save us today. So brothers and sisters, with great love, with great love. Thank you so much. Inez, big shout out to Inez as well. Big who organized this event and also Inez was the, you know, the beautiful artwork that you guys have seen for both the first event and this event. This is done by our sister Inez who never wants to be recognized, but I really want to recognize her right now. Love you, Inez. Desiree, what a song. What a, what a beautiful prayer there. Yeah, and so what a great way to end. This... What a great way to end. Klee, Klee, go ahead, sorry. Uh, half a day to our relatives from Guam. Also to our brothers uh, and sisters who are fighting for freedom as Papua. We're right there. We're right there, our hearts are with you. Full of Inaka to our brothers and sisters from Fiji. Corina, sorry, Corina. I had to give a shout out to my peeps. <laughs> <laughs> Love to all of you, see you all next time. Take care. Bye. See you, Corina, good to see your face. Good to see you too, Clee. Yeah. Miss you. Yeah, Take I miss care. you too. Love you, family. Love you, auntie. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you so much for the beautiful song, huh? <laughs> beautiful song. Can't wait to hug all of you guys soon. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hi, Bikey. Hi, Bikey. Hi, Hi, Kamel Kao. Haya Kamel Kao Haya Kamel Kao